Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Pavla Niklova, and I'm the executive director of the Václav Havel Library Foundation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the spring weekend of stage readings prepared by the Havel Foundation together with the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association. The spring weekend is part of our annual Rehearsal for Truth Festival honoring Václav Havel. During the past and this weekend, we have presented live online readings of contemporary plays by award-winning European playwrights from the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia. And for the first time, we also presented works by young playwrights who won the Best Men Drama Student Contest organized annually by the Havel Foundation. First, let me thank all our partners for putting this series together. They are Theatre Institute in Prague, Theatre Institute in Bratislava, Theatre Institute in Budapest, Polish Culture Institute and Slovak Consulate General in New York. This program would not be possible without the support from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and Council Member Ben Kalos. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Council Member here now in person with us this afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Pavla. And for everything that you do, I'm council member uh, Ben. I usually say Kalos, but in this audience, in this company, <laughs> I'll say Kalos. Uh, I represent the Upper East Side, East Midtown, East Harlem and Roosevelt Island. Uh, the neighborhood I represent was once known as a uh, German town and attracted the uh, Czech community, the Hungarian community, the Romanian community. Uh, it was a, a little slice of immigrants and 40% uh, of New York City residents today were not born in the United States. I wanna thank uh, the president of the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association, President Joseph Laws, uh, as well as your vice presidents, uh, Susan and Irene for having me. I'm so honored to uh, be here to join you in the reading of Ghetto Love uh, by uh, a Hungarian author and my family comes from Hungary. Uh, in fact, we come from Budapest and uh, my family actually left Hungary right after Kristallnacht. Uh, but I, I couldn't be uh, prouder to have a uh, Hungarian author, uh, Tamás uh, Retzie, and uh, just to have the topic of the uh, Holocaust uh, addressed here is so important. Uh, we've been through a lot in our country. Uh, we've been through a, a questioning of uh, what the truth is. Uh, it is no time more appropriate to have the rehearsal for truth than after a leader in this country who questioned what the truth was every day and people died because of it. And along those lines, there are still people today who do not believe uh, that the Holocaust happened, which it did. And there are so many people who can testify, but those people are, uh, uh, are, are slowly uh, having to be no longer with us. And so this play is incredibly important for that reason. And I can't wait to uh, see it and share it with all of you. Uh, thank you so very much for having me. And it is my honor to uh, uh, sponsor uh, and and provide some modest support for this great program. Uh, Thank you very much for taking time of your busy schedule and for joining us and and for your continuous support of our programs. Thank you very much. Um, the aim of our theater programs is um, to enable New York and American audiences to experience theatrical works by Central European playwrights. And on the other hand, we hope that this is a unique opportunity for American directors and actors to try these plays on stage or these days on Zoom. However, we hope that at the end of June, we will come back live at the Bohemian National Hall in New York and uh, hope to welcome you there as well. So I'm very happy that I can welcome guests from Europe. Today we will see the play Ghetto Love by Hungarian author Tamás Ecce. Good afternoon, Tamás. 
It is also my pleasure to introduce Mate Vince, who's the director of the Hungarian Cultural Center in London. Hello. And I'm very pleased to welcome director of today's reading, uh, Lisa Arendel. And also the wonderful cast, Jane Arnfield. Hello. Uh, Rebecca Giver. Hello. Catherine Grody. Hello. And then uh, last but not least, I'd like to introduce the translator of Ghetto Love, Bori Rieger. So uh, as you see, we have a wonderful audience from all over the world. Uh, it is partly thanks to Mate and the Hungarian Cultural Center in London who has promoted the event. And I'd like to ask Mate if he could say a few words to our audience as well. Uh, thank you very much, Pavla, and, uh, and thank you all for uh, working so hard in, in putting this uh, marvelous play uh, on, on a virtual stage at the moment. And I, I, I hope it's, it's a first step and uh, this will lead to the, uh, to the real stage, a real live event uh, quite soon, as I'm sure we are all hopeful. Um, uh, we, we really wanted to uh, to help you spread the word about this uh, this play in, in in London and in England, and it's not just because I I used to I used to be the director of the uh, Hungarian Cultural Center in New York, and my part of my heart is uh, is, uh, is still there. It's not because of that, but because um, it comes uh, at a at a very important time, and. Uh, and it's not just uh, not just what you have already mentioned, but it's also because uh, the Holocaust and and uh, the other traumas of the 20th century that this play focuses on uh, is very important for us Hungarians to overcome and and to to realize and to and to and to finally uh, you know face our demons in this in this uh, um, um, approach and. Um, the reason it's so timely is because in April, in April we have a special uh, Memorial Day for the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust. Just last week we commemorated the, uh, um, the National uh, Commemorative Day of the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust. And the reason we, we thought it is very important to specify an additional date for the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust is because uh, we have to we, the government really wanted to emphasize, and Hungarians, us, we really wanted to emphasize that the Holocaust is not just something uh, that happened in Germany or happened in Poland or happened to Jewish people, but it is also a Hungarian tragedy. Uh, we have lost uh, about uh, 500,000 compatriots, uh, many Jewish uh, people, but not just them, also, also members of the Roma community, uh, political prisoners, or uh, I may say that even a, even a Scottish uh, lady, Jane Heining, who was the head of the uh, uh, Scottish Missionary School in Budapest and saved many children, uh, she had nothing to do uh, with being a Jewish. She just she just saved uh, many children, and that's why she was arrested and then died in Auschwitz. Uh, so it is uh, it is a Hungarian tragedy and. Um, and when uh, young directors uh, like Tomás is uh, uh, focusing on a delicate topic like this one, it is really our um, our duty and our task to to put a word out about it. And I would like to say thank you, uh, Pavla, for uh, focusing on this on this very important topic, Eastern European uh, Holocaust, uh, for for years now. And uh, I would like to. Thank uh, Ben Kalos, uh, a member of uh, the council, uh, for his support, and I'm really looking forward for the for the play. So thank you very much, Mata. Thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you for joining us, and um, I know that um, the audience is getting ready to watch the play, and so I just would like to tell them that they can say send their questions that we will be back. And now I would like to ask Tamash if he could say a few words about the play itself.
dear audience, this is the true true story. Is uh, that is uh, my idea. Uh, welcome to the presentation, and I like is better we can talk afterwards the stage reading. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. And uh, we are going to disappear and uh, leave the Zoom for, for, for the actors. Enjoy. Ghetto Love. Three women each talk to the doctor alone. A play in three movements by Tamash Retsei, translated by Bori Rieger. One, Dad. Allegro vivo. Fast, but not too fast. Oh, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. But I did knock on the door of the doctor, but never heard a yes, nor a no, no. So go on, go on, eat up, son. Oh, wait. He, he keeps whistling like a gypsy, like a hungry gypsy. That's what they say in jest around there. It's like, oh. I called you son, didn't I? <laughs> oh, well, you don't mind that, do you? Hmm? No. Oh, well, oh, even though Barak Hashem, I only have a daughter. <laughs> Her dad, he wanted a first rate soccer player, a little push gosh, too late, uh, sorry. Oh, maybe our grandchildren. Though the first grandkid was a girly too, Esther, the Sean, the Madela, oh, Edith just gone and carbon copied us. Not the boy to be seen. Not the boy to be seen in the lot. Association for Women. Ah, Pelicula okay. That means thank you in gypsy. Yeah. Ah, I hope Martin speaks to you in Hungarian, huh? N not in his dreams. He's become a believer now, now that he's undone. He spent 50 years instructing us otherwise. Did you see his brothers coming to visit? The ones with the ginger beards? No, 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 I'm just joking, Baruch Hashem. They all perished as boys. It's cause of them. I need to rush in here every day to yank him back. They're tugging at his hand, sneaking up on him from behind his medical chart, like they're just finishing up a long abandoned game of hide and seek. Not, not on my watch, no. Mm -mm. Have, have you got the sweet tooth? I brought some apple fluid knee. Yeah, takes nearly a day. It's such a hassle. My mother-in-law taught me all of it. The whole, the whole cash route. Ooh, you got a good appetite. That's what I like. 
and no need for washing up. It makes my hands too dry and mine are rough as it is. Oh, sometimes, sometimes we washed the dishes with pure chlorine as there wasn't enough water, scoured it with lime and we all ate from the same dish and drank. Chlorine makes me nauseous. Or it goes down the wrong way, the, the gypsy way, as they say. Hey, what? No, I, I'm allowed to say it. I only believe this much if I don't know the, the way of the land. What should I do with this envelope, with the money? I, no, I don't want to cause offense. I'll just I'll leave it here on this chair and then... La la, doctor, he'll find it all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I laugh so much since my husband's gone to the hospital. Maybe it's my way of crying, eh? Who knows, who knows? There's that song. Uh, do you often have to therapize the visitors or do they understand that you're a, a cancer doctor and not a hot wire? <laughs> oh, yeah, we had to clip, we had to clip the wire from the lobster's claws after boiling. My husband, he breaks out in rashes, so he only has lobster once a year and then watch out because boy then he just eats loads of it or if he's gonna be sick anyway he might as well enjoy it yeah mm. will i ever see him eat lobster again huh oh. do we all come to you with the same questions huh you must be sick of it how old do you think I am, huh? Oh, it doesn't matter. The point is, Marton can't die before me, okay? I won't be a black widow. Don't ask me to take a seat or you'll give me a heart attack. You won't hold the bells for us, will you? Want to talk? Well, I'm afraid, dear Dalabari, I... Look, I have to flood them up. I spent all day baking. I, I should go. You are always so quiet, Doctor. And I can't suffer silence because you never know what's about to emerge. It's difficult to say something right. One needs quite a bit of talking before knowing just what to say. Listening to his silence up there is more than enough. I've said to him, I come to you along a well-trodden path, like a gypsy caravan. I've had a traveling circus since I was a kid. A graceful ballerina, a dancing hen, and a roly-poly clown, all wind-up toys. I paraded them across the kitchen floor, singing, So, comrades, come rally, it's the last fight we shall face. It made him laugh. Yeah. Doctor, how much did you tell my mother about his condition? Were you honest or did you hold back? What's your name, son? Don't, don't scold me if you've already told me. Mine is Emisha. You should speak to my mother. I haven't seen her in years. I bet she's gone gray. Arise, you walkers from your slumber. <laughs> you, you've probably guessed which song it is by now. Well, that's how I want to keep his memory alive. Did I already tell you that too? I'll get one of those wind-up clowns and set one off buzzing into his hospital room with its flywheel, and he'll start chanting, Go, comrades, for sure. Oh, a Henry Cario. <laughs> Sounds German. But then all doctors are German to me. Is mother bent? Uh, did she shrink? You know, just so that I can imagine her now. 
not that I care. It will be a paternal parade. We will turn his sickbed into a podium. You just nodded, doctor, right? You could write it just down and I read it at home, right? Write it in medical Latin because I won't understand none of it anyway. I read your tarot cards before I left, came up with a rare card, thought it means some sort of change. <laughs> How can someone as macho as my dad get prostate cancer? Has Edith been here, my daughter? I'd like to know when she'll come strutting in here to see her father. This was her lullaby, and now I'm lulling Morton with it. Everyone is my child, right, son? You've got no answers, doctor. Mm -hmm. I've got to guess. And then, does he at least know where the cancer is coming from? Which part of the body? <laughs> I call him dad too. D'Adoro. He was Marton for a while, then a weasel, then a stallion. What? I'm allowed to say it. Okay, let's do this. You won't tell me anything just yet, all right? Think, think it over, take it into account. Little comrades, all dressed up, Mother's Day is here. I I'll change it to Father's Day. Even Mother calls him Dad if talking to him, because she wants to come, you know, she wants to come, yes, uh, between us, elbowing her wings in. She never had it proper with her dad, so what does she want with the word anyway? <laughs> to devour everything. You never said I could come in, so I wasn't even here, okay? Tomorrow, if I can make it, it's not only he who needs shielding. You understand, don't you, Henrik? Well, I'll stop calling you son. I've got the envelope. I'm a dummy. What? I'm allowed to say it. We should sneak my daughter in. That would really give dad a reason to celebrate. We can prescribe it as therapy. Talk my mother into it. I I'll think of a story of how you could know about the girl. In our family, being natural must be carefully constructed. You can forget about spontaneity. If I want to see my daughter, it's a long story. <laughs> the flow the express up toward two is on its way. I've got some other oil with me too, the miracle drug. Oh, I was wrong before. The tarot card, the, the card means one should see themselves clearly. <laughs> Does my mother usually pay her visits in the mornings or in the afternoons? Does she come to see you too? And rather skip causing a scene. Put a flower in the window if she's here. <laughs> Wouldn't you be a, a French Henri, just for my sake? You've got yourself all mixed up, doctor, in our family idol. Daddy pays and mommy cooks. Well, it's great to be together, right? Well, you've got to try to make jokes when you don't want to cry. You know what I mean, doctor? So this be the glorious god of infirmity? <laughs> it's me, Esther in makeup we had rehearsals the security guy let me in without a hitch i thought i'm a proper lady he did <laughs> you didn't even have to come down to get me i just waltzed up here congratulations seem in order i believe no it's actually right that little girls aren't allowed to such bleak wards i've changed my mind she hasn't been here yet has she yeah, even my mother wouldn't torture the child like that a funny old play called Derogia we are putting on in drama club for the carnival. It's about an old woman acting like chicks. Have you heard of it? It's clear that dad is Jewish because he's been cut, not mother. Look at me. I don't have our Jewish community on my face. 
I didn't take after my father. They called me Safi at school. There's that operetta, the Gypsy Baron. My dad used to sing it by heart when I was a kid. It would have been great to be a, an actress, to shine in sparkly wigs. Is my mother's hair white or does she dye it? Oh, do you know what, doctor? I don't care. The main objective of this, too, is the performance of the nature of the heart, that it is good or bad, strong, clever or foolish, uh, through which it makes one enthusiastic and corrects and instructs the other. Prologue. He wants to change people. <laughs> I think it's cool. But first, he just shows how shitty they are. Let's plan how we will celebrate that. Nothing else matters. It's terrible how you lead me into these blind alleys with your silence. I wouldn't go there on my own. Do you not talk this much at home too? Has grandma left? Of course, even she wouldn't recognize me. She does have a good sense, good nose, even though she's not the big nose child catching witch. But on second thought. <laughs> Please get my daughter in here to see my father just once. I can't even see her. I didn't let it slip in front of Grandma that you knew Grandpa, Doc. How exactly? Don't get angry if you've already told me. Grandma says I'm such a scatterbrain sometimes. She has a remark for everything. So typical. So, you knew this is when I'd come today, Henri. The patient's lift is out of order, bad luck. My knees are too bumpy for these stairs. Oh, once I could keep standing like the tin, said fast tin soldier. A lot depended on it at the appels. You know what that is at the upper plots. Do you speak German when you're not French, Henri? They read us out every day over there. But you've probably never heard of Dormagusha soup. Don't, don't bother looking it up in a cookbook. Some recited recipes to each other at the camp to keep their spirits up. That's how they ate, with their words. Marton reminds me of them as he is laying here. But I will keep coming in here and shake him out of it as long as it takes me. Can the nurse walk me to his bed again? I'm afraid of stepping up to him alone. His face is like a mask. His skin is so stretched. I'll wait. I have pretended that they've swapped places. Mommy lays and Daddy cooks. It's great to be together. <laughs> Doctor, are you grinning? So when my granddaughter came and asked me to pay for a survival camp, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> Thanks. I was never even here, Doc. Nishtu kun shlekut, mame. Nishtu kun gudtort. It's the Yiddish proverb. There's no bad mother and there's no good dad. I thought if I looked at her through my father's eyes, I'd ease up on her. That's one of the reasons I come here to learn to look at my mother kindly. Don't laugh. You aren't even laughing. Did you understand what I was on about last time? Oh, crazy old hag, you, th you thought. Will you let me know if dad poops himself? I'll bring diapers and wipes. Oh. Oh, look, I forgot to pack your cake. What a bibex below I am. All the patients are the same to you, aren't they? I should think. I'm not trying to be rude, but in my line of work, all Johns are the same. I turned off the emotions and focused on business. I prized each moment. You owe me big time after all the hours I've spent here. I'd like it if you would look at my father differently than the others, not just a spread out body. It would help him and me if you could think of him differently somehow. He was great in every way, a great Indian chief. 
you tell me if I'm laughing too much. I, I just recently started being like this. And he's real strong, defying his age. Yeah. Is he still strong? I mean, a born survivor. I love how he managed to stay dapper through it all. To me, he's like a James Bond. Even as a child, he, he saved my mother from the unimaginable, pulled her into the cesspit, up to their necks in it they were. Great family legend. Daddy Bays and Mommy Cooks. And... <laughs> I wasn't able to come again. It's all that hassle in drama club. Rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. It's driving me bonkers. The only reason I haven't quit because I wouldn't have anything to show granddad to cheer him up. Someone told me that their father fell into a coma and their mother made sure someone from the family was always at his bedside to hold his hand. They didn't let his hand go down even for a moment. That's how they kept him going. He pulled through. It wasn't a blood transfusion, but um, a spirit transfusion. <laughs> That's how I see myself, a spirit infuser. The lager in Auschwitz, the chaos at the end, that's where they started. I, I hold him up as he did me till now. That's how I keep him here. Our system has turned inside out a bit. He always held me up when I was fallen, and now he's gone and fallen over himself. Never before. Oh, once, just, just once, yes. I want to be on stage, not at rehearsals. And now, guessing what he was so much busy, he starts to sprinkle on Israel Dream honey. Israel, the big bass, whom his honey of sleep immediately put into a slumber deep. From her enormous bass, Israel fell over. Stealthily, Eris took her place with maneuver. An old Jew she became, and the wink of an eye. The Lamberg synagogue will have no such rabbi. Dad is more of the family to me than mother. She's always lacked something. Perhaps someone to be the daughter of. At home, she was still a little girl. I could have been a boy next to her at best. Dad's little boy. I just realized that not so long ago. Is that crazy, Doctor? When his darling Edith left, it nearly froze the heart. The heart froze the heat in his fatherly heart, crushed it. Dorochi has one of them, a typical old maid. On her brow, a wizened strand, a, de a well-deserved aid. She wore a wreath for old age in those ancient times when on the siege of Troy, Homer wrote the first lines. Emma Shea's dainty derriere, an epigram from my mother's childhood. On the stool, Lenchesh, the joiner, carved it on with a butt-shaped imprint in the middle. Yay! Gilika, her beloved sister, sat on it in the cattle wagon, transporting them out of the Comoron internment camp. And her mother, the grandmother that I never met, her father, Gilika, for four days, one slop pail for 80 people. She told me about it. Dad told me about little Emma Shea too, how she wandered around looking for her parents in the barracks with her stool. She had it with her when she fell into the cesspit. When I see her as a child, my mother, I can love her. But everyone needs a real mother, right, doctor? Did I see a nod there? Mm, Paranatotrunana. We were coming home in the evening and there was no one there. Edith packed her bags and disappeared with that devil because that's what he was, the devil. 
And she even robbed us. Huh. Money, jewelry, bonds, all gone, wamush. He was, he was never a stable man. A bandit is what he ever really was. And we, we just sat there, looted and empty. That shitty bitch may well be old, but she's got silver, she's got gold. If I could dig my hand in those, I'd mind much less drawing her clothes. <laughs> How was I? You can tell me. I won't be offended. Would this make Grandpa proud or not? Could Dad have been my mother, too? All rolled into one? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, at least I got a laugh out of you. My goal is this, here in this hospital. It is not just to leave him laid out. To cheer him up, all the way up. I do the same with my daughter. With everyone, I'm a giver. That's never been a problem for me. There we sat with Morton crushed together like in the old days in shit. Cause that's how our life started with cests in the lager. Don't leave me to cry. That's how people really get old. Doc. You asked if I have a message for my mother. I got nothing to say to her. She's nothing to me. I don't care. Please don't tell her I said that. Maybe that's not even what I meant. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know nothing when I'm so stressed out. My father had that uh, sense of humor. Such a clown. <laughs> like with the roly poly. Oh, my papa, so funny, so adorable. Always the clown in his funny way. <laughs> yes, you see, I knew. You know it. Doctor, how does it go? I know last time you wanted to tell me something with your big broody bedside face about the Martin, but you don't know him yet. Listen, listen here. Martin spent three days in the gas, but the white ambulances couldn't arrive with a, the Zyklone B because of the bombing. So when they opened the bolt, he came out completely sane. Many didn't. So, so what's fatal for some may be a, a piece of cake for him. But do tell me in time, shall I bring my granddaughter? I'll, I'll only do it once. There's no point in making visits with death, none. Why should I know anything? How can they call themselves the adults when they know nothing about themselves? Do you know when I could ask questions? At Seder night. For grandpa, I had to play all the sons. The smart one, the wicked one, the simpleton, and the one who doesn't know how to ask a question. And don't you dare laugh. I'm good at playing guys, at playing anything. Do you know about arthritis? The nape of my neck, it's, it's a bit bent, see? It's, it's, it's swollen. No one has been able to loosen it up with a massage. Someone said it could be my mother in there, you know, holding on to me by the scruff of the neck. She's moved in and uh, she's straining me out. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. It's just a passing fancy. But, you know, if there was any way that you could maybe uh, tenderize it a little bit, well, then I would be happy to leave my lump here well gotta go to work the night it's mine what will you do without us hmm? have you got family oh, hold on with your big speech okay uh, what i have to see i will see it in his face anyway i knew many who died because they couldn't collect them from the barracks for days there was enough room in the burner. You're already dead if the capo kicks you in vain because all you do is stare at a point without moving. You're gone, stiff, no matter what happens. About to cross, just one last puff and gone with the smoke. 
fuck, I so need a smoke right now. I get so worked up about it all. Not the Seder, that's just funny. But about me having to be the adult, making up for the missing others. Is it mental? That's crap, thanks. <laughs> do you like to play uncle with everyone or do you just want sex? Sorry, it's just better to know. And you're not really that old, are you? Gray can be attractive, I guess. I can go, right? You're so quiet. It seems I've got to do all the talking in here, but feel free to tell me to put a sock in it. How did we end up here from Edith? You are a body doctor, not a soul doctor. Oh, why don't you tell me to stop, Emiche? So now suddenly, oh, suddenly the body has some strings to the heart. Can you stethoscope that? Surely, surely you can't put Moton's prostate cancer down to some sort of business of the soul. Bless him. He was always a wild buck. But that's not about the soul. We made a good match in that. He pulled me to himself in the middle of all that shit. There I was. Stumbling by the fence, I lost my mother. Gilki was dead. I, th I thought my father was dead too. He hugged me and I can still, I can still feel that hug inside me. It survives inside me. If we'd be friends, I'd ask you to hold me like he would, but I won't mess around with you. I know a lot about sex. Don't get all excited. I won't show you, nor will I talk about it. I'm just saying. Is the chubby nurse coming today to take me up to grandpa? I'll wait. I've thought of needing to find someone I can talk about this, a sort of listener. And then God shoves me through your door. I so fucking didn't want this life. Where can I give it back? Don't worry, I won't make a scene. I'm talking so much you could make a serial about me. <laughs> a case study. But you don't have a case on me now, do you? <laughs> How old are you? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Reality, it always croaks you. I don't mean you. No, oh, I often dreamt about freedom in the barracks and of the lager since I came home, as if I was wired the wrong way around. We're all bundles, yeah. You know, you know, you know what I mean, right? A web of what was, what is, and what we want, and no one to untangle the threads. Mm -hmm. Dad was my my guideline, M Moton, I mean Moton, but uh, Daddy's not a Teddy. I'll keep it in check. Moton, Moton, I'll try not to forget. He he was Emmanuel when I first met him, but don't don't be confused. He needed to Hungarianate. I was lucky with my mythological name, Emiche. He, he needed the Hungarian it. I, I never got the Jewish nose. We didn't carve one. Martin tried to keep his down. We learned that in the lager, even how to be shit. Then we relearned to be faithful without having faith. That, that was the first untanglement. We were faithful. The regime asked for it. As he saw it, we couldn't afford to have it happen to us again. Yeah, it makes a difference which side of the whip you're at. Martin wanted to be the one to decide what we do and don't do. We Romans use signposts to guide us as we travel, like, you know, those ahead leave signs for those behind, leaves, grass, or if the wind's blowing, a stone on top. A, a rag will do if they can make out, I mean, a skirt. 
So Marton did his best in slowly prevailing new order and kept on leaving the stones on the side for me as he forged the head from the communist youth committee leader to the union to working for the party. On and up, Marthon passed, and by 1968, he had a seat in the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party Central Committee. Didn't even want to speak up against invading Czechoslovakia. And you know when he laddered up the most? When all of a sudden there was a vacuum in the march ahead. All the pushing and positioning nearly stopped. In, in 71, not hard to remember because Edith was born in 72, June, hmm. a Gemini she is. We were hopped up about Marton's promotion. Uh, she was, oh, she was born out of that intoxication. I, I had to be careful because I posed for the lady painter. Oh, no. I feel I'm tangling a pool from a, a knitting basket. See, this, this is it. Everything's all knotted and bundled, right? Because for me to have a daughter in 72, at 42, my picture of the lady painter had to fade. I'll, I'll explain, un, uh, untangled. I was painted back then by Dina, Dina Gottlieb. She was Mengele's painter at the gypsy camp. She had the portrait whoever Mengele was interested in, naked. We were out of our clothes a lot. My father worked around the doctor with a, with a wheelbarrow. We could write letters to each other. I still have one. Used to, used to. Hmm, used to have. It disappeared when Edith ran away. It was in her porcelain ballerina box. Oh, how it danced. Hmm. Edith took all her circus stalls with her as an adult. I saw, I'm sorry, I'm a bundle of nerves again, twisting, twisting around inside me. What am I trying to tell you? Is that when I went to the logger fence toward the mail camp, because the planes were shooting from real close, I was real scared all by myself. I started to call for my father at Mengele's barracks to come out, to come out. Gilkali died. My mother was nowhere to be found. And that's when Marton pulled me into the ditch still a manual at that time, but don't let that confuse you. So that is when we in, interlocked. Well, I've told you that already, the, the base bundle. I, I didn't know for a long time why I couldn't have kids. Because I was with Dita Gottlieb too. I don't know if it was because of this or not, because for a long time, no one checked it for me, but I loved the embrace Marton saved me with, much more than anything else he had to offer, but he, he was a wild buck, but I'll let you in on a secret. He had a child. He had a child not from me, before 72. Now, this is a very tangled bundle. A star-eyed little boy, he played soccer with him, but didn't call him Puskas. Maradona, rather. Yeah, I can live with that because Morton never left me with a signpost. Maybe he guessed I'd be lost without a dad. I mean, Morton, without a Morton. He's not your papa, nor your mama. That's how 71 burst into our lives. Through Marton's career, the Hungarian party delegation's plane crashed. You remember? Crashed in Russia. 35 dead. Terrible. But a lot of doors opened up.
They needed new cadres. Marton could go all the way up in the White Party House headquarters, and soon Edith was born. And then you can imagine, you can imagine as a doctor being an experimentee <laughs> to give birth. That's when I was remade. At her birth, I was reborn to around the or as they say a woman's either in labor or nursing or ill. So could you spend <laughs> Oh whoa why didn't you tell me look it's getting dark Hello You sleeping? No I appreciate your patience well, if I had known this, if a fortune teller had told me if it ever came out in the readings, <laughs> no, you know what? I wouldn't have given birth. No, no, I won't forget to bring the talc. Papa, can you hear me? Papa, can you see me? Papa, can you find me in the night? Papa, are you near me? Papa, can you hear me? Papa, can you help me? I am frightened. <laughs> Two, mother, ad libitum, with free rhythm and expression. When I was last here, I went on rambling about everything, but I didn't bring up the real issue. That is why you doctors haven't figured out anything against cancer yet. Then what have you been doing all day long for so many years? It's so, so typical, you know, it's so typical of God to afflict my dad with cancer right there. My daddy always said there is either no God or he doesn't deserve belief for all his evilness. Imagine today he didn't react to anything, just stared upwards. And there's a new crack, a new crack in the ceiling. Probably that's where his brothers are coming for him. Is he getting worse? But I brought talc. If he asks for a, a last cigarette, I forbid it. He will not blow any smoke out of here. Anyway, it's not allowed in here, right? Right? Of course not. You don't have any on you, do you? I could really use one now. I'm feeling like myself these days. Oof. Hands shaking. I've got the cake right here, homemade. I suppose I should really move in here already. My feet hurt. Isn't he getting better? That's what I felt because he called me his little star soccer player again. That's how he teases me now. Then he asked for a celebratory dinner. I'm afraid he meant Seder night, not the hospital meal. He's got his times all bundled up. Poor dear. We'll have fun again. I'll clown about and it's bound to raise his spirits. Mental? Oh, that's crap. Thank you. I won't smoke it out. It's getting better to be here than at home. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> Don't laugh. I'll laugh about it. Always dragging myself around. I'll push myself if others don't push me away. My dad once dragged me back home. He wobbled home after a year after us in the middle of 46, long after the end of the war. First, I waited for him, searched for him. We both did. And then we didn't anymore. He arrived and ordered me out of Martin's family. <laughs> I spent two years at home again, just the two of us, but I had to fill all the shoes. I, I was either little Gilkala or my mother or myself, depending on my father's whims, like, like a puppet show. Of course, he was least interested in me because that's when he noticed that the others were missing the most. He, he could only bear that with wine. Truth is, he he didn't know what to do with me as Emeche. What's more, 
What's more, when he looked at me, I looked back on him with my mother's eyes. So I fled back to Martons when I was 19. Gone awfully Jewish, I did. Now, now that's what I call a multiple disadvantage. I, I could open my own minority protection bureau. <laughs> Zali, are you bragging or complaining? That's when I usually laugh. Oh, oh God, I'm tired, doctor. I've, I've lost my role. Who should I play and to whom? Do you have a sick bed for me? Because my feet. The question of why he was admitted here in such a jiffy boiled inside me. Maybe he couldn't take my mother anymore. Back in the day, I had to clear out too, so I could finally be myself, so that the mumptopus couldn't reach me. Maybe dad is just seeking refuge here and is playing the invalid. He had an iron will in him once. Oh, but no, no, I have another Jewish memory from before that. As I said, things get all mixed up if I don't untangle them, nice and ordered. I mustn't leave it muddled up. Now, I haven't even asked if you were devout, doctor. Martin says that's what we should be now again, but not Jewish, mind you. What I wanted to, oh, wait, we were back. We were in Barrack B3 by the puddle, right after the cesspit, the last shipment had left the last machine gun toting guard and then even though i had never heard of a female rabbi mrs weiss held worship <laughs> she did all the you know all the tottering back and forth and all the torah was in a bundle of clothes and after that something else happened to me oh i um i ran away i haven't told you about that have i with the stable man he was grooming the horses by the track and they called him Hufa. I whispered, my horsey, into his ear. A huge, well-ripped hunk, all hot and sweaty. Well, I needed somebody to rescue me, like the princess in the tower. Someone who knows how to give me a good seeing to. Someone with strength, who can be followed. Organizations organize trains for the survivors, destinations to Australia, America, Czech Republic. Gypsies were mostly sent there. Martin said I was a Jewish girl, and that's how I got on that first transport back. Him, his mother, and the vices. One look from him, hmm. and I was pregnant. Where was I? Where did I start? You never helped me, I've noticed. They disowned me, because he was Romany, <laughs> just like me. They didn't want a Romany family. Mother did all the yelling about him being a gypsy, not dead. He just sat there, deflated. I'm just sitting here and past memories come flooding, flooding me. But why? Huh? I just, oh, I recalled, I just recalled the most important memory of all. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm sick of my own voice, aren't you? We didn't say a word. Not even, see ya, we're off. My mother, she had this um, extra precious letter. You could say that it was everything to her. It was to her father, who wheelbarrowed for Mengele and that Miklos Nisla. So it seemed that they were allowed to write letters. Well, here it is. My dearest daddy, I do so look forward to your letters, for they always lift our spirits. Look after yourself, with an exclamation mark. We often think of home. I got the bread and socks. I don't wear the dress. I don't. I'm afraid that they will take it. 
I'll try to get to the fence. I'd like to see you. Gilika is dying minutes away. There is a, an epidemic and we can't drink the water here. I'm always thirsty. I call out your name at night, can't you hear me? I'm waiting for you, another exclamation mark. Kisses from your very loving little star. She got it back, the letter from her father. She ran away from him as a teenager. Oh, you know, that's another running away. <laughs> well, I've never thought of that before. And well, there, this letter, it fell out of Hoofer's laundry bag after our escape. I've got to say that it frightened me because I knew where my mother kept it under her jewelry as her most prized possession. Hoofer, he also stole her dad. I knew right away that I had to give it back in exchange for my daughter. She's mine and this, this is hers. Marton's mother, Miss Esther, took me in and gave me a new family. I could be Emisha again, just Emisha. When I unexpectedly fell pregnant, I thought if it's a girl, I'll call it Esther as a sign of gratitude after my mother-in-law's death. But when Martin heard the news that a child is on its way in the winter of 71, he confessed that he already has a son without me. I wouldn't call her Esther after that. God rest her soul, Miss Esther. But from Estherville to Esther won't. Mm, I chose Edith instead. Martin argued for his dead mother's memory in vain. My daughter was named Edith. And that's how my granddaughter became Esther in the end. Mind you, that's not what she started off with. At first, she was Dorothea. Where Edith came up with such a corny name is beyond me. Just to spite me is where. But she was brought under my care, and we decided she'd be called Esther from then on. A fitting name for such an important family. Martin says her name with such devotion. You'd think he was talking about an angel. I think he sees his mother and granddaughter in one. How can a mother be capable of taking another's child, especially if she's her daughter? I mean, will you think about the bed? Would money help solve the question? You know, I've been raising my granddaughter for a while now. I already told you when I said I'd only bring her in once when you let me know it's time. Why should I have to solve anything in her? Oh, oh, my daughter can't sort her own life out properly, not to mention a child's. So, who's the mother of whom here anyway? Well, I, I can't stand their ground for everyone. I'm supposed to have a life of my own, even if these are eating it up without thinking twice. Why is it that everything is just worry and stress for her? She's as reckless as my father was or his father. Would she rather carry on that tradition? Is that what I've been struggling for? Should I be a stand-in for all those who have been gone from her life? You know, she's become unprotectable, the prodigal son, but will she ever return? She kills with her love. She is unable to love. You know, she'd like to surround me like some camp. Eat it, eat it. Mother has always been stuck there ever since. Hiya, I'll just sneak in. Could you tell me the name of the other drama club? The one you mentioned. They're gonna cancel ours as everyone is studying for finals. <laughs> I don't really care. Uh, when I went to school abroad, we didn't have to cram this much. And it's not like there are any more stupid over there than here. Nobody called me a jip either. Oh, we put on Dorchia. Uh, they clapped. There was a bit with the old woman. <laughs> they even laughed at that. 
Deep melancholy covers her head like steam. The canker of anger turns her seat hard and mean. Eris visits each and every craft limb of her. On her heart and liver, she pours seedling color. Each part inside of her craves for urgent outlet, especially where her hysteria is nested. <laughs> oh, my lord, have I been born to this destiny? No man will be lying lovingly beside me. Why have you allowed me 60 years to linger when no running wing will flip on my ring finger? You can't claim I have not been waiting for ages. Why can't I for this time get my well-earned wages? In good faith have I been celebrating Advent that an eligible young man will be sent. The carnival season I could in good cheer spend, hoping my maiden days will come to a good end. Hmm. Even if my head were a huge chamber pot, and my coquettish tongue chattered strumpet-like lot, even if my attempt was of a novelist or like a lady, I had a long word list. I could never describe in detail and notion what has truly happened during this commotion. Sacred and secret much remains anyway. Not even poets know each and every true way. The audience seemed to get it. My mom wasn't there. My stomach was in knots because I thought she might show up, but she didn't. <laughs> Better this way, actually. I don't know what I would do without my grandchild. <laughs> A real mensch. She's seen a lot, too. I'd like to cover it from her eyes, but this is hindsight. I'm an eraser, Grandma, a magic eraser. I like that story I used to tell her, so many stories, oceans of them, so that I may change the reality in her head. For example, because the Pharaoh persecuted the Jews, it was God's will that the Black Sea swallowed the Egyptian troops up. Only one Egyptian boy and girl survived. They wandered for a long time, almost starved to death, and were forced to steal. This is the origin of thievery. Gypsies come from this wandering couple, from the very same place. She took my daughter because of that letter. Doctor, we'll talk to her on the phone if she calls. There will never be such a distance between us that me and she had. No matter how much the old shrew schemes, she can't get between us. Dad told me my, my daughter was in a play one called uh, the Rocher of all things. <laughs> but he asked me not to go, didn't want any cat fights. I did some acting too back home before we moved to the Netherlands. I'd like to check the other drama group out. I've gotten really into acting. I don't know, it makes me feel so ethereal. Get it? <laughs> Doubt it. I got life, mother. <laughs> I've taken over telling her story, I've knitted a new life around her. I become, I become an alpha mother. Get her acting genes from But I was no ordinary sort, more like a street theater market. Mm -hmm. It was Hoofer's idea when we ran out of cash in that remote country town. Mm -hmm. He was the producer. Mm -hmm. I stood by the sideway of Highway 7 and every third guy stopped. Mm -hmm. We would go to the rest stop. I had to start, um, you know, undressing a little so that they would too. Mm -hmm. And then a buff copper would start knocking on the windshield. The guys would grab, you know, their trousers and then it was actually quite burlesque. Um, but of course I would have them pay me in advance. And then they'd bribe the cop to evade a report or having to provide any personal data. And the cop, well, he was easily corrupted because it was really hoofer. Crime. 
and punishment. <laughs> Grandpa's favorite film's Pretty Woman. <laughs> he still got it on VHS. I wanna be your fantasy. Well, baby, you could be mine. Well, you can leave it all up to me. <sighs> Don't you just love Prince? more than life itself don't you knock vivian i have a business proposition for you what do you mean i'm gonna be in town until sunday and i'd like you to spend the week with me really could i pull it off I told her bedtime stories of the wind's children at bedtime who are always wandering. Let her learn about her ancestors, because it's not only Jews who came from the gypsies, but Indians too, yeah? Did you know that, huh? Yeah? Both races originate from the Antalantians, but before the whole America, you know, sank under the salty ocean. The proof of this is that the Indians had exactly the same way of checking the teeth. <laughs> does, does that make you laugh? But in fact, everything is a great big one and the same. I never asked Hufa where the uniform came from. I liked being someone else. Uh, Sharon Stone, uh, Demi Moore or uh, Julia Roberts. <laughs> weaving a fairy tale around myself, not like the ones my mother wove around me. Grandpa knows the pretty women of Budapest. He's taken me to Hotel Gellert, where he introduced me to one. Two, actually. I was fooling her with these stories rather than telling her her mother was an international slut, <laughs> a whore in hell. Dad's a story maker too, though. Uh, he had an uncanny ability, you know, to have the yarns spun by his people. He only told me two of the network tricks that he used to loop around the enemy. One was medical, doctor. Mm, now that's got you interested, hmm? right? Well, it's actually a state secret. It was the same Drochia, the play we put on. So everyone wants it with everyone else, except no one wants it with the old woman. That's why she takes revenge on them. It's the same story time and again. Mother says the world is run by men's dicks. <laughs> Grandma says it's a secret Jewish society. Grandpa talks about invisible nets. So, which one is it? How did I, someone who hates being touched by a man like that, give life to that? The freak, where, where did she get that blood from? No, no, not her father, don't even think that. He had decency. He would have had the connections to look for his daughter, get her brought back home, but he didn't use them. Mm -mm, no, he has dignity. It's only me who sings. On behalf of everyone, deep into the shit, I sing. You know, you, you can't wait, Doctor, can you, to hear the story? I can see that greedy look in your eye. Okay, well, so my dad, he had these people on the old abortion committees. And um, if a woman who was known to move in opposition circles went to them to beg for an abortion, they would find out who the possible donor daddy might be through the interview or a bogus questionnaire. If the pregnancy was out of wedlock, they could go and congratulate the baby daddy. And just like that, they'd got him by the balls. Well, you know, they'd be willing to sign just about anything. You see how the dicks make the world go around. Well, there's nothing new in that. You just have to find the right way to grab on to things. Doc, you also told me about that family net thing, sort of like a family tree. She's been to Amsterdam, Brussels, Nice, where they even have fire barrels set along the side of the road, like, like traveling gypsies. It came bursting out of her, her blood, the wanderlust, and she dragged her little girl with her. 
And if she couldn't come to me with her any time, I, I just, as if she couldn't come to me. I just, I wanted to snatch that child from her arms. How did she come up with such ideas after the way we'd always protected her, led her, helped her all her life? Hmm? How do you stop being human? Not the mother to her daughter, not a daughter to me, a uh, true nothing, a, a piece of flesh. Yeah, I was a piece of flesh once. I know what I'm talking about. Sitting all day on a cold chair, naked, laid out on a table. Dear, dear God, what have you got me saying? There was another one, real harsh, at the Octagon, a famous square in Budapest. There was a notorious men's public toilet down below, as if the men were descending to hell. A couple of two-bit wired offices were sent down there too. The old regime persecuted homosexuals, but if that's what they get off on, what can they do? Go underground. And they didn't know that some of them down there are talking to some of them above. That's how they secured their compulsions to descend. My dad's a genius. I told you so. He really knew how to tap into men's weaknesses, and I just, you know, took it from there. If the other drama club is boring, I'll just leave it. It doesn't matter how much you praise it. <laughs> I leave everything. I get bored. I, I can hear my style is getting rusty. <laughs> Not talking like my husband, like sliding back into the bed, little girl, the, the unpolished me. <laughs> And then there was the last plan for Dad. It was there that he finally hit the wall. You know, at first it sounded promising. He could practice his own faith again. I'm sure that it would make his eyes sparkle. But what do you ever get for free? We only ever get as far as a desire for freedom. And then one day we realize they've got us by the scruff of the neck. Just look around at all those slanted napes. Dad was supposed to report on the chief rabbi's circles. It was a prestigious task. And then from one day to the next, he's a stagehand at the National Theatre on minimum wage. He resigned from it all. Starting something is fine, but sticking with it? Ah, <laughs> nothing's really interesting for too long. Maybe just until the first taste. Like, if I hook up with a guy, which is also starting to get old, by the second time we have sex, it's just bread and butter, <laughs> nothing more. Why do they give so much of themselves away? Why can't they be more mysterious and elusive? Like my grandparents. Anything that's too close turns to ashes in front of my eyes. Why do you think this happened? Hmm? How could my daughter turn out like this by, by her own choice, huh? She couldn't have inherited my memories of the camp, right? I didn't get them from the womb. They did that to me. I've never told her about it, nor did her dad, no. Once he told Edith about a dwarf who guarded the king's castle all day long, but everyone teased him. That's all, that's all. You probably don't understand what that's got to do with the lager, and there's no such fairy tale. Neither Jewish nor gypsy. It's roly boly. It's roly boly the clown, no? He was an acrobat. Sorry. Well, that's sorry. He became a clown later on after he died. He was sent to Auschwitz because his yellow star was too small. He was a, a midget person. If he had worn a star, according to regulation, he would have turned into a walking yellow star, as itsy bitsy as he was. So he became the doorkeeper at the SS barracks and had to, you know, salute all day. They kept bringing him gaudy uniforms and laughing at him all night. Then once, once they'd had that fun, they sent him into the gas chamber even after all that. But he didn't completely die. Not the way Morton didn't, because his body suffocated. But in time, he became a roly-poly. 
You've probably seen him, one of those clowns that keep writing themselves up, those wobbly toy men, you know? He was, oh, he was a great favorite, the roly-poly clown. I sure am my daddy's girl, just the same. You know what, though? I can get up and leave everything behind. My mother, she always wants to pull me back to her rules, you know, maybe even back to her belly to eat me, but not to destroy me, just so that I won't be a separate entity. She doesn't know how to handle freedom. She's afraid. And she tried to make sure that I'm afraid of everything too, because then maybe I'll need her more. It scared me, so I took off. Because I have no fear in me, just like my dad in that way. We are our freedom. Standing in a cesspit, if that's what it takes, or among the prop workers. Well, we've got the world wrapped around our fingers. Finesse. Doesn't matter if it's a, a Jewish or a gypsy trick. It's all about the fish line that hooks everyone. Now, mother isn't like this. She's always will stay deported. She stayed in that life. See you. I'll tell them at the drama club that the doctor from that elite hospital has sent me, the one who was at the camps with grandpa. Or isn't that a good icebreaker? <laughs> For a while, I thought you were younger. If grandma finds out, she'll move right in with all her stuff. I have a toothbrush and a towel. Look, I am very scared of that hole in the ceiling above Martin's head. I don't mind if you say I'm crazy. It, it, that buys me that bed in here. I'd make a great crazy lady, yeah? Huh? I'll have you know, dad didn't even stick to my disownment when my daughter was born. He became a secret grandpa. He tricked my mother by saying that he was visiting his son's child. You know, that's just the way that we are. But even we can't get away with a trick forever. But you know, that's a different story. Really messed up and uh, complicated. Oh, doctor, you're giving me that look again. You like the stories they put in front of you? Hmm? Do you take them home? Or do you just digest them while you're here? Does anything ever get caught? When it all changed abroad, I was willing to start all over again because of my daughter. Actually, well, we left because of her so that she would have a better life than in a godforsaken country town. But Hufa couldn't get a uniform right away and he didn't want to kill for one. We decided I'd actually do it for a while. He'd look out for me in the background, uh, from the darkness, in the moonlight. Only he wouldn't knock on the windshield anymore while he tried to figure out how to score a police uniform real quick, badge. I thought a lot about Pretty Woman, that I'm playing her. Pretty woman, walking down the street, pretty woman, the kind I like to meet, pretty woman. I don't believe you. You're not the truth. Don't look at me like that. My parents, they recited recipes at the death camp. That's how they ate. So why can't I pretend to be Julia Roberts while they're at it? Maybe if I was born in America, I could be her. And then all the men would want me. I'd be unattainable. I'd be a main goal, like I was running the world, you know? It would sort of revolve around me. Oh, why am I even telling you this? Oh yeah, because of the tricks. I think even we couldn't get away with playing tricks forever. It was in Holland when they caught Hoofer because of the police uniform. He beat some young guy for it, uh, real bad. So I was left on my own with the child. 
And then a nice lady, she came up to me, uh, maybe Indian, not gypsy, to the window, you know, where I, uh, where I had to stand all day. And then she told me about herself and asked about me and she took me in, said she was interested in my story and that others would be too. We started an entirely different kind of prostitution. Seances, if you will. We called it a performance. You know, I was back to the theater again. Somehow it never leaves me. Maybe it's because of dad, as by then he was the stage manager at the National Theater. Oh, do tell me, doctor, if I'm all over the place. But all of it is linked to the story. You know, we set up in a safe house in Amsterdam for vulnerable girls, where, well, we actually set it up as well, and uh, they could work there in the house, uh, you know, if, if, they, if they wanted to move in with their kids, and if they left the streets, and then I said they were willing to work in the house, they could tell their stories in front of an audience that advertised performances. You know, I, I really couldn't care less if the audience paid up because they were perverts or because they sympathized. The main thing was that I was able to get a lot of girls away from the fire battles. I felt something that my dad and mother did in the lager during their legendary embrace. It was the same embrace that I gave to those abandoned girls. You know, while I stood with them there in the shit. And then I lost my daughter. <laughs> As I said, we only get to the stage where we dream of freedom. And then they catch us, you know, by the scruff. Can I tell you about one more thing? They came for my Dorocha, found her in the house, barged in into my performance with the verdict ready that she doesn't go to school, but she did. I always enrolled her wherever we stayed, but she didn't like it and I didn't want to force her. I wanted her to be free the way that I couldn't be for so long. And then the Hungarian authorities came, breathing down my neck, that the girl is under Hungarian jurisdiction and compulsory education, yada, yada, yada. My father wasn't the one behind all of this, so as you can imagine, you know? I know. Maybe that is what made him ill. Oh, maybe it will sound like a confessional. No, I swear. Even the thought of my mother sitting on this very same chair makes me gag. I've realized that's why I'm so stressed. That's why I can't properly tell you what I'm feeling because I can practically hear what she'd say about me. Meanwhile, it's like both of us are talking at the same time and one of them is in my head. I looked at the marriage line um, on the palm of my hand, but the whole thing, the whole thing might be my fault with Martin's illness. I mean, I mean, maybe I did it to him with always wanting him to be by my side, to come home already and hold me like he did then and, and there, but nothing more. But just keep his dick in his pants. You know, I think I wished it would just dry off. Yes. And if you think of something for too long, it comes true like, like a curse. But it was really for me about the hog. Zuchitu Marsha. Well, so much for labels. If you're a Jew, a gypsy or a whore, not to mention me, doesn't matter what you do. Just one of these labels and you're assigned to a well-known fate won't let you be anything else. I couldn't protect my own mother from it, or me from her. She brought the verdict. She, the one who herself was saved by a Jewish person, although from the Jewish fate, fate swap. Maybe this is what my mother fought against all of her life to overcome her gypsiness. You know, I never hurt anyone. Only they hurt me. I was never good enough. How do, how do they call that monster that um, is put together and has stitches all over his face like, a, like Frankenstein? 
like Frankenstein. That's it. That's how I feel about my Jewishness. And since he's been brought in here, the real original Emeshe is breaking out again. Oh, do we have to go? I have to go. We'll carry on later. But from now on, my dad will be the only topic of discussion. He's the main character. You know, I, one last thing. I'll tell you this one last thing. I committed a very big sin against my daughter. Maybe she brought me here. Maybe I'm coming for her, but always end up missing her because I ain't got the strength. I left that with Morton. I, th I think I won't be able to tell you properly don't even know why I keep getting into it like it was my time coming. And I wanted you to write it all down real quick. I wasn't a good Jew because I never told my sons anything, my daughter, because there is there's just no right way of telling it. No. Three, our daughter, Avet you also in a loving, tender way. I'm here. It's me, Esther. Can you hear me? I, I confess I didn't prepare a performance. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. You spend so much time in the theater anyway. Shall I fluff your pillows? Brush your hair? No? Is it true that the trouble spread to your spine? It's grandma who told me. It's not grandma who told me. They say you're going to have a long operation. The doctor, I got it out of him. I like him. Looks good for his age. Did you recognize him? I thought so. Did you see mother? I'd ask you if she left a message, but who knows if you just make something up, because she didn't. I didn't bring a new poem, because the new drama group doesn't have scripts. <laughs> they go on about themselves, being themselves on stage, what happened when they were kids, at school, their virginity, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not all that bad, actually. Write tense, and we get through a lot of tissues. <laughs> You think I'd cry at such a scene? Well, I definitely wouldn't if I'd be playing with you. Maybe that's why I didn't come prepared with a boa. I didn't even know how to come here to rehearse with you. <laughs> um, can you give me some more money? Grandma is so strict. I know, I know, I have to say a poem first. <laughs> uh, want me to improvise? Uh, so so he strolled to a place, a certain ill-fated Ill hut, uh, where music resounded like a virgin's first shriek. Ah, uh, <laughs> a strumpet's trumpet-like flower cup opened up, and the hot father's milk was flowing for a week. Ah, <laughs> uh, isn't this too racy? I've got these pictures in my head. Yeah, if I could show imagined scenes, I'd... <laughs> I'm a shoe in for an Oscar. No one could stop me. Now that would make great theater. I'd give them a family story that never even happened. Could turn on the waterworks too. That's right. Like this. Daddy babes and mommy cooks. It's great to be together. <laughs> Something shocking and striking, like the big toes on Picasso's pieces. If I had dope on me, it'd be easier. Once, when I wasn't very sober, I thought I was sharing a baby pram with mother. Yeah, can you just see it? Funny, isn't it? Grandma is pushing it, but leans in close, like she wants to be the hood, the rain cover, but it isn't even raining. And she doesn't realize what she's really doing is blocking out the sun for us. We're crammed under her breast. And the cobblestones on the Danube bank are fucking bumpy, where she's pushing us along in a hurry. You're there too, Grandpa. 
walking right by us in the water. We wait for us to come and jump in. The, the water seems pleasant. People are brought on trucks and they undress and start jumping in, but grandma doesn't let us. She is once again scared as usual. And then as we are rolling, the baby pan, the baby pram stumbles over a stone and we tumble out into the water next to you, finally with you. And we begin sinking into the deep, just swallowing, swallowing the water with everything bubbling around us like we were at a soap bubble blowing competition. The sun shines through the surface of the water and we watch each other with eyes wide open holding hands. Daddy bathes and mommy cooks. It's great to be together. Others keep falling in too, but we don't care. We are floating around and it feels wonderful. And then grandma shows up and tries to hug all of us in one single embrace. She's shaking and we all have to just shake along with her. She pushes and shoves and treads water, sweeping us out there. And then you grab her and you pull her right into the middle of it. She loses control. We all bend over her like she bent over the baby pram and we sink deeper and deeper for what seems like infinity. Feeling more and more liberated until we reach the other side of the earth. I think we just pop out on the other side, like a human octopus or a um, pile of corpses. All our toes are cold, our midriffs too, because we lost our clothes in the current. The sun is shining and we cry out like newborn babies. Enjoy! Can I hug you? I don't want to cry. Tell me who you'd most like to hug and I'll bring her here. Yeah, uh, Julia Roberts, right? <laughs> Let's go visit her. She, she's at the Hotel Gellert. Uh, shall I sneak you out for an embrace? Come on, I wasn't being serious. The trouble has spread to your spine, Grandpa. What are you doing? Lay back down. Uh, we are not getting into the Danube. It's fine. Everything is fine. I'm holding you. Can you feel it? Emesha and Edith enter in the dark. A Kaddish begins to sound. Esther steps between her grandmother and her mother. Holding their hands, she becomes a bridge between them. Fast darkness. End of play. I will join us as well, and Bore, I think I'm coming. Uh, thank you so much. It was a, um, an incredible performance, really moving and heartbreaking. And I'm, I'm really, I'm moved to tears. Uh, it's unbelievable what you were able to do with the play on Zoom and being alone in your rooms on your computers. I really would like to congratulate you from my heart and thank you from my heart for doing, for presenting this, this beautiful play. And uh, maybe before, if we get some questions, I'd like to ask Tamash to, uh, to comment on his feelings and also how you wrote the play and uh, 
And let, let's start from that. Tamás. Tamás. Nekem van a kérdésem? Uh, igen, azt, azt, uh, azt szeret, azzal szeretnék kezdeni, hogy uh, milyen érzéseid vannak uh, most, uh -huh. és hogy uh, milyen volt uh, megírni a, a darabot, vagy hogy írtad a darabot. Erről tudnál egy kicsit mesélni? Uh -huh. Megrázó volt meghallgatni, azt mondhatod nekik, nagyon, nagyon ikletetten csináltam mindenki. It was quite moving for me, and everyone was um, seemed very inspired. Or it, it, they were inspiring performances. Yeah. What what was the very personal as well? Milyen volt megírni? Nagyon sokat kellett hozzá olvasni az eredeti történet mellé, és nagyon felkavaró volt. So uh, about how what it was like um, actually writing um, the text, the script. Uh, it was I had to do a lot of reading, um, um, and uh, as well as the original story that I built upon, and um, and it was a it was a very it was a very emotional time and experience how how did you find out about that story would be one of my questions and also how would if you could talk a little bit uh why you decided to have three female characters who speak to two men that we never get to see Akkor az első kérdésem az az lenne, hogy hogy, hogy ismerted meg ezt a történetet. A másik pedig az, hogy hogy jutottál arra az elhatározásra, hogy három női karakteren mondja el a történetet, miközben két férfihez beszélnek, akiket ugye nem hallunk meg. Csak egy férfihez beszélnek. Én találkoztam a közökső hölgyel kutyasétáltatás közben, egy olyan környéken, ahol még akkor álltak az utcán prostituáltak. És nem tudom milyenek okán, talán a kutyám okán kezdtünk el beszélgetni, és nagyon hamar kiderült valamilyen érzésből, hogy nem tudom más, hogy mondani, hogy van egymáshoz közünk, és ezért vissza kellett többször mennem, kifizettem az együtt töltött perceket, és ő elmesélte az életét. So it, it I was walking my dog often in a, in a place where, um, or a, a road um, where prostitutes um, worked, and um, and I, I think we got start, we started a conversation Um, because of the dog, we sometimes chatted about about my dog, and and um, we somehow figured out that there was something that connects us, or there's something, yes, something that connects us. And um, then I started paying for for her time, and um, for the minutes where she told me told me her story. <laughs> hogy az összes felmenőm holokauszt túlélő, akik sose beszéltek erről. And um, part of part of the part of it is all all my um, uh, all all my family had been um, holocaust survivors who never spoke to me about this, as I've told Lisa. Úgyhogy lehet, hogy őket írtam meg valójában. So maybe it was them that I was writing about. Can I, can I still ask what, what made you 
leave out the, the male characters? És azt azért megkérdeztem, hogy miért döntöttél úgy, hogy kihagyod a, a, a férfi karaktereket? Én egy színház rendezői oldalról jövök, és nagyon jól tudom, színházvezető is voltam, hogy mennyire kevés a nőkre írott darab, és ravaszul abban reménykedtem, hogy így hamarabb színre kerül. Egyrészt, másrészt íróként sokkal jobban érdekeltek a nők, most is így van. Néhány darabomat bemutatták, és 70%-ban nők álltak a középpontjában. A férfiak egy picit unalmasak. Aki túl sok darabot olvas, az rájön, hogy a férfiak már unalmasak. Um, so, um, I'm, um, I, I'm also a director, so I have a director's outlook. Um, and I also um directed a theater for some time but but as a, a I'm, i'm quite aware that they're not enough place for for female with female characters and um i was i had the idea that maybe it was easier to get it put on stage um if there if it provided opportunity for for our act, female actors to um Mm, to perform so and and also as a writer i just find and i i found and i still find women more more exciting and interesting to write about and um i have written um several plays that have been staged and um about 70 percent of these um do portray uh women characters or are centered around uh female characters And for someone who reads a lot of um, leads, reads a lot of uh, plays, men have actually become quite boring, to be honest. <laughs> Ebben a darabban is ezt néhányszor elmondják a hölgyek, hogy egy központi kérdés van egy férfi életében. And um, and the the women in my play have also or also say this at at a number of occasions that there is there is one central uh, question in the middle of every man's life <laughs> can i yeah sure catherine i just i just i i first of all thank you tomash for uh I love your point of view of women and I love uh, that you've written so much for them. I just can't help but tell you that I have managed to raise two exceptional sons who are in their 30s. And one of them recently said to me, you know, it's a very strange time, mom, when women think you're exceptional just because you're not an asshole. If you can translate that. So I think there's a lot to explore in what's underneath a lot of men that just have a lot of covers, you know, but the vulnerability lies underneath. So I just give you that if you're ever so inspired. But I thank you very much for the work that you haven't done, that you have done. Thank you. Quite um, Először is meg szeretném köszönni a, a sok munkát, amit a nőkért um, tettél a munkádon keresztül, és, um, és hogy a, a, a női szemszögöt uh, mutattad be. De hadd meséljem el azt, hogy hadd mondjam el, hogy nekem két kiváló, különleges fiam van, akik most már a 30-as éveikbe uh, járnak, és... Um, és mondta az egyik fiam, hogy annyira furcsa időket élünk, mert azt gondolják az emberről, hogy azért, mert nem egy seggfej vagyok, azért valami különlegesség vagyok. Úgyhogy azt is amúgy nagyon érdekes lenne megvizsgálni, meg vagy kicsit beleásni abba a kérdésbe, hogy miért kell ezt a sok szintet, ezt a sok kellemetlenséget fölvenniük a, a férfiaknak, miért teszik, amik, és hogy mik azok a sebezhetőségek, um, amik meg a dolgok mélyén vannak. 
ha esetleg ez a jövőben valamikor inspirálna. Értem. I just meant to share a little sentence, Tomas. That sounded like a huge novel. That's, that's Sorry. the challenge of translation. <laughs> Csak egy pici, egy rövid mondatot akartam mondani, de hát ez egy hatalmas szövegnek lett lefordítva. Köszönöm mindent, ami a, a dologból kiindul, és ami eszükbe jut. Thank, thank you for everything that, um, that um, you, you think of and you share. I, I would like also to uh, turn to the director and to ask Lisa if you can speak, comment a little bit on the play and how difficult for you was to cast the characters or rehearsing and uh, uh, what you would like to say about the process and about the play itself. We don't hear. We don't hear you. Thank you, Pavla. Is that better? Mm -hmm. um, I'm. I, I'm. I have to say to my actors. I'm so um, overwhelmed. Really, the storytelling was so uh, uh, personal and private. So thank you to Catherine, to Jane, and to Rebecca. It was really moving. I, I really uh, was with you and I appreciate you. Pavla, uh, we had uh, two rehearsals. I didn't want to uh, take too much of their time and it's a lot to get us on the same time zones and everyone has work. Um, Tamash, Thank you for sharing your words with us. Bori, thank you for being a bridge between us and Tamash. Um, Tamash and Bori Pavla gave uh, their time to me. I had meetings with them separately so that I uh, wouldn't have to take more time from the actors. Um, I, uh, when I was asked to do the play by you, When I originally read it, I thought, what can I offer here of my own personal experience? I'm primarily an actor. And so I'm, I always uh, look for doorways from my own life into my art. So uh, of course, initially I wanted a doorway for this play for myself. And I foolishly, thought, oh, what can a black woman from America offer a Hungarian play? And once I read again and then again, I realized, oh, this is a play about three generations of women. And I know about this. In fact, as I read the play, I turned uh, Emisha into my mother, Daphne, And I, Lisa, became Edith. And then my daughter, Jordan, who is 18, became Esther. And then the voice was very, the voices were very easy for me to understand personally. Yes. Um, and then um, I thank God for reminding me of the piece of music of Brahms, Violin Concerto that I fell in love with um, many years ago. Every time I heard that music, I would cry. I remembered it and then I listened and thought, oh really, these three women are one voice, one woman at different times on the same timeline um, as, as the violin could make the uh, uh, um, uh, alto or the bass voice, the alto voice and the soprano voice. The one violin made all of the voices. Um, so so that's, that, those were the door, that, that was the doorway for me into this. And I, I'm, I'm honored that this would fall into my lap and, and Pavla, I, I I'm so grateful that you introduced me to the opportunity of working on uh, a play that needed translation. 
uh, uh, through words, but also uh, humanly in the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gori, are you going to translate for Tamaj? Or that will take. Yeah. Csak mindent a lányáról kapcsolatosat igen, a színésznőkkel kapcsolatosat is. Mi volt a vége talán azt nem, meg majd Bori nem is van meg nekik, hogy én, én is látok ott három nézői kérdést, azt majd ne felejtjék már el, és az egyik tök érdekes a harmadik. Jó, um, rendben. Um, és a vége az csak annyi volt, hogy uh, ugye van egy, ez a Brahms darab, igen, igen, nagyon, igen. igen, és hogy meg szerette volna köszönni Pavlának a lehetőséget, uh-huh. hogy, hogy ezt a, ezt a, a szöveget, aminek nem csak a szövege, volt szükség lefordításra, hanem ugye, hogy, hogy a, az emberi része, vagy így az érzelmei meg az átélése. Hát annyit azért mondja Lizának, hogy ő magár, de ezt mondtam, hogy végtelenül szuggesztív, és az első megbeszélésen éreztem, hogy jó kezekben van a darab, de amikor utána néztem, hogy kik játsszák, akkor meg már teljesen biztos volt, mert annyira jól osztotta ki, és annyira oda illő embereket választott. Már csak, amikor csak a fotót láttam, már akkor lehetett érezni. Értem. Jó. Um, so, um, Tomás said that I think um, I've already told Lisa, uh, but when we spoke, I immediately knew that she she's a, a, a very sensitive and very um, is a very very sensitive uh, person, and that this play is in good hands. The script is in good hands, and and uh, when I saw who she cast, I mean, I, I knew that that it will be great. Um, even even actually seeing the photos, it was just such the casting was so spot on. It's very impressive. And um, Tomas also asked me to mention that he saw that there are two, three uh, questions from the audience, um, which which one and and there some of them look quite interesting. I. I... I maybe I, because I want I I'd like to yes Lisa yes I just want to briefly say uh, Catherine may have to step away okay she has something else but I wanted to just say it so that when she if she disappears you know okay. I love you Catherine thank, thank you. you Lisa Jane Rebecca Tomas Pavla Bori Mate forgive the mispronunciations. It's been my privilege. I look forward to meeting you in your cities or in mine in person someday. So thank you very much. I've got another five minutes and then I don't want to be rude. I don't know the politeness of disappearing on screen, but thank you. Thank you. And I see you soon. Um, so as, as somebody mentioned, there are a few questions about the director and also about actors. So maybe I I'd like to read one comment and one question and ask um, Jane and Rebecca. Um, so uh, Marilyn Wyatt, she writes, I'd like to congratulate the playwright and actors for a stunning performance. They were able to convey vividly the way the trauma of the Holocaust passes to successive generations. This is an experience that's been discussed a lot in America, but it was interesting to see it from a Central European perspective. I'd like to ask the actors whether they drew on their own family histories to bring such depth to their performances. Oh, Jane or, or Rebecca, would you like to speak? Or, and Catherine also, or you're still here. I'll just say before I go, I'm an American Jew. My father and mother were both first generation. My grandparents on both sides came from Odessa and my husband's family all came from Lithuania and Poland. So there is this thing about epigenetic trauma that you inherit in your DNA, even if you don't experience it directly. I think that's true of most people that have experienced traumas as because of whoever they are. So certainly that is a familiar story, but it's never been told quite from this perspective in my experience. So I thank you, Tomas. And I hope many people hear your story. And I have a million questions and I'm going to get killed by my family. <laughs> Goodbye. 
Jane or Rebecca, did you want to answer the question? Rebecca, or shall I? You, you first. Okay. okay. Um, I, uh, it's a great question. Thank you very much for that. I don't have any family relatives and I'm not Jewish and I have no connection to that period of history. However, I am extremely interested in how um, we as human beings witness other people's stories and how we hold other people's stories and how we tell other people's stories. And clearly being in the theater, it's the perfect vehicle because it's all about storytelling. So for me, it's about um, human interest. It's about research. It's about uh, empathy. And it's about hosting a story. So that's not my story. That's the woman that Tomas was telling us about. And I was very interested to hear Tomas that this woman exists and that you had these conversations like these almost biographical interviews that you did with her. And then from that, it inspired you to write your, your play. So it's testimony. It's a theater of te testimony, a theater of witness. And that interests me greatly. Um, I have had the opportunity to work on another piece from the Holocaust, uh, where I did similarly, Tomasz, I interviewed somebody who had, she was Czech, and who as a young woman had experienced the Second World War. And, um, you know, that was also very, very interesting, because again, I have no connection to that. So it was very much about working with a living person, um, and ensuring that that memoir that was a book could be transformed into a piece of performance, but it's always about the hosting of something. So, um, you know, the, the host is the story owner, but then offers it to me, I'm like a surrogate, and then, but I'm also hosting it for the audience, and then they end up with it, and they're also hosting it. So by the end, the whole circle's gone round, you know, and we're all witnesses. So that's for me what, what theatre does. Thank you. Yes, I, um, I definitely, uh, a want to echo what Jane said about sort of um, hosting and then transferring so that the audience can host. Um, I have studied this period, um, but uh, I think that for me, because um, Esther is like the younger generation um, and she's sort of, I, I think for me, the kind of central question was, um, the question that I think a lot of young women ask and look to the older women in their life to ask, which is like, how do I, how do I be a woman? And so even though she's talking to this doctor, um, I think that that was sort of the question that helped me kind of think about the, the role of this sort of younger person in the play. Um, and, um, and also, uh, just thinking about um, the uh, the kind of panic that can come with with knowing that you come from so much pain and that it's still so alive, and not knowing, you know, when you're when you just sort of inherited it, not knowing um, how to kind of separate it from just the air that you are breathing. So that was yeah, what I was thinking about in preparation for this. And then just Tamasha's beautiful words. Thank you. And um, um, maybe we are coming to the to the end of our meeting. But uh, Mata, would you like to also um, uh, comment on on the play or on our common experience from London? Uh, just I just want to say uh, thank you very much for. Um, for, for, for all of you to, uh, in bringing this uh, um, this reading on tonight and uh, I think it was a splendid performance uh, really touching and uh, I, I'm, I'm quite sure this is not the even though our, our meeting is about to conclude this is not the end of something but I, I do hope that it's uh, it's a, it's a new future for this play and uh, and it all started here so. Thank you very much for, for all of you who uh, took the time and efforts to, to make this a uh, reality. Thank you, Mati. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I would like to echo that for me, the play brought so many themes. Of course, it's it's the trauma of Holocaust and of, uh, of uh, another 
political oppressions of the last centuries that uh, people who come from Europe were were influenced by and they and they are still with them and so it really opens a lot of questions so it's not only that then of course it's the this generational thing like what you want to say to your kids or um because it seems to me that that's one of also the the themes that uh keeps coming back in the play that do do, do you should should you tell about your bad experience to your kids uh maybe your first instinct is not to because you want to spare them but maybe you can do more harm because then uh, some things are not explained or are missing in their lives and so uh, I would like to thank all of you for for basically opening all these questions and uh, I agree with Mate that it's the it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk and it's been such a pleasure watching you performing and talking with you and I sincerely hope that we'll meet again soon hopefully not only on zoom but maybe in person either in Europe Budapest London or here in New York thank you so much thank you so much Pavla thank you so much Tamash and Bori it's been an honor and for my actresses my god I'm so grateful for you it was beautiful really really beautiful <laughs> thank you <laughs>